we're gonna take a little bit of a different approach because I think probably everybody in this room has at one time over the last 18 months um, had a presentation on the transit plan. Um, we're gonna review that, but then we're also going to move in to a bit of a discussion on transit-oriented development because this is something that goes hand in hand with increased transit. So we thought that's gonna be very important, especially for Garner, since um, you all, um, depending on how the voters uh, vote, uh, may have commuter rail uh, and may at some point in time have bus rapid transit. So we'd like to really kind of go through some of that with you today and uh, paint a few pictures. There we go. So when we did this, um, th when we started this plan, uh, we gathered up a number of different partners that needed to be involved. And the ones you see here on this, uh, on this slide were the ones that actually came together and helped funded um, the, the, um, uh, the development of the transit plan. And everybody stayed at the table. Everybody is still very much at the same table today. And this was one of the differences between this planning effort and some of the previous planning efforts. Because we really worked hard to develop a solid group uh, and then develop stakeholders and so forth and do an educational piece as well as a planning piece. Can we go to the next slide, please? And so the first question here is why? Why do we do this? And you've maybe seen this map before, but this is a map of the county. Uh, the red lines on this map indicate that in 2010, those were the roads that were already uh, over their service capacity and the ones in yellow were coming up on their service capacity. And if we can go to the next slide, so that was 2010, and this is what it might look like in 2040. Now, one has to consider whether this type of transportation network is the one that we really want for Wake County. Because with that type of congestion, will come other disturbances to our current quality of life. So we've gotta be really mindful of how we approach investment and in infrastructure for the future of all residents here. Next slide. Um, we also conducted a very large amount of um, public outreach. Uh, I'm told that this is probably the biggest public outreach that Wake County has ever sponsored. And again, we did that collectively with all of our partners. You can see some of the stats up there, and we're still very, very busy making sure the people who need information on the transit plan are able to get that. Next slide. So the Wake County transit plan includes what we're calling four big moves. And the first big move is stronger regional connections. This truly is a regional plan. Go Triangle's a regional agency. We worked with our partners to make sure that it had a regional focus. Uh, and ties the entire region together because we function not just as a county but as a region. Uh, the first big move, our, our uh, initiative under stronger regional connections, would be a 37-mile commuter rail system. And you'll have you'll see a video in, in a few minutes as to what that might look like. Uh, but that would be from Garner, where we sit now, to all the way to West Durham in partnership with Durham County and, and Go Triangle and the other partners. Uh, future rail connections expanding on the commuter rail, perhaps out to Johnston County and Clayton, and then north to Wake Forest along an alignment that's partially owned by Go, Go Triangle already. Uh, it would also include expanded regional bus service. We have a good regional bus service today. We will increase the frequency of those buses. We'll have additional buses to RDU on tighter time frames. So we'll expand regional buses as well. And the, the last big move is uh, express bus service that we have today will also be expanded. Next slide, please. This is a map showing you the regional connectivity and support in the first big move. As you can tell on the map, the uh, sort of purple line that you see is a commuter rail system that I described, eventually expanding into Johnston County and up to Wake Forest. But from West Durham to Garner as the initial segment. And then the express bus service you see in, you see in orange and a the Durham Orange Light Rail Transit System, an initiative that Go, uh, Go Triangle is working on with Durham and Orange County today. You'll see on the western end of the territory in green 
and then a line to RDU Airport to Mooresville will be an express or a, a shuttle service from the commuter rail uh, to, to the airport. So not only will we have expanded bus service to the airport, we will have connectivity between the commuter rail and the airport as well. Next slide, please. The second big move is connections to all communities. We'll have bus links to all towns, and between all towns in the urban core. There'll be new links between some smaller communities. And we'll have, uh, we'll have an improved bus service combination of 30 and 60 minute all day service, peak service, and that will all coordinate and tie to the commuter rail as well. And we will also provide a 50% match to local communities for local services that they develop. Next slide. This is a map showing you the communities and the Wake County plan and how it will tie the services to the urban core and link with, uh, link with the commuter rail as well. Next slide. The next big move in the plan is to provide frequent, reliable bus service in urban areas. And this next statistic that I'm going to tell you that you can see on the screen is really, really impressive. Today, we only have 15 frequent, 15-minute 15 headway service. Uh, for, on 17 miles of the bus network. That will expand to 83 miles of the bus network. We'll have every 15 minute service. So dramatically expanded bus service is a key, key cornerstone of the plan. It's absolutely critical. Weekend and evening services will also expand and we're developing bus rapid transit as part of the plan on four corridors and we'll show you those in just a minute with 15 minute service, about 20 miles of bus rapid transit. Bus rapid transit, those of you in the uh, room that have ever ridden it understand it. You may not if you have not seen it, but it's a bus service that's different than a conventional bus service. It operates in its own right of way for portions of the route, so you're not as impacted by traffic and delays, so it's a faster bus service. It has level boarding, so you can purchase your tickets outside of the bus, and you're not delayed with folks having to work the fare box when they board the bus works very much like a rail system, but it's on rubber tires. So it is different than the buses that you have experienced in the Raleigh and Durham and Chapel Hill areas today. Uh, it's a dramatically improved service over a conventional bus and will work very well. Next slide. This is the, a, a map of the expanded bus network. You'll see the frequent network, which will expand to 83 miles from the 17, as I just reported, and then the BRT corridors. The corridor running north out of downtown Raleigh is along the US-1 corridor. The uh, line running west will operate between Raleigh and Cary, and then you see a line out 64, New Bern Avenue, to Wake Med, and then down south, Wilmington Street. So those will be the four BRT corridors in addition to the expanded bus network that you see in the, um, uh, in the red. Next slide. The fourth big move is enhanced access to transit. It's great to have a robust and improved transit network, but it's of little value if you can't access it. So we're gonna expand and improve many fixed route services across the urban core, and we're gonna, we're gonna expand and improve the non-fixed route paratransit services as well and provide 50% match, as I, as I indicated earlier, for towns to establish local services within their communities. Next slide. This is a map of the services that are there today and also the enhanced access to transit that will be provided in the, in the outlying communities. Next slide. The important part of the plan is the funding assumption. The pie chart that you see before you breaks down the funding uh, in federal dollars. It's a 27% assumption that would be funded through federal means, through the Federal Transit Administration. Uh, you can see uh, only a 1% uh, share for uh, state funding and then local and debt financing making up the remainder. So it's a very conservative plan. It's very well thought out and well funded. Next slide. For the first 10 years of the plan, and that's 2017 to 2027, the capital outlay will be $1.6 billion, of which $886 million would be for the commuter rail, the, 30, the commuter rail segment in Wake County. Enhanced bus and BRT, bus rapid transit services, would make up $670 million, and other capital and future capital, about $60 million. Operating costs, uh, $674 million over that 10-year period. Commuter rail being $20 million. A bus and BRT, 654 
$1.5 million, and then a fund balance allocation of $109 million. Next slide. It's a little different when we look at it in a 20-year viewpoint, not just the first 10 years, but the continuation for the, the following 10 years. BRT, enhanced bus service, and bus infrastructure then make up 57, 58% of the total, $2.9 billion. Commuter rail would be $1.5 billion over that 20-year that, uh, period, which makes up 31% of the total. And future capital projects and operating, $460 million, again, over a 20-year period and a fund balance allocation of one point, uh, excuse me, 120 million for a total of 5.1 billion invested in the transit in the community over the next 20 years. Next slide. So transit-oriented development, I wanna talk about what that means and we'll just cover a couple points of what is transit-oriented development in the next several slides and then we'll see some examples of that as Jim walks you through uh, some of the developments that have occurred around a line that he's very familiar with, the SunRail line into and out of Orlando, Florida. Uh, we can go to the next slide. Transit-oriented development, what does it mean? It's great amenities that you can access on foot. It reduces the need to have an automobile. There are job opportunities across the region, so you have connectivity between the transit and, and the housing around the transit and the development. It's mixed use. Transit-oriented development, it's not just residential or retail, it's a mix of uses around the transit nodes. It's uh, designed in, 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 in a way that is pedestrian friendly, it's easy to move about, it's safe, accessible roadways and pedestrian areas. And it creates a higher tax base because you have denser in, uh, development around the transit nodes, you increase your tax base and you have less need for public infrastructure because of that density. Next slide. A uh, couple examples, bus TOD. TOD is not just for rail systems, light rail or commuter rail. You have transit-oriented development springing up around the country around bus services and bus rapid transit services as well. A suburban TOD-oriented uh, bus, uh, uh, TOD-oriented to buses is becoming more common. Uh, many times you'll have a park and ride lot as part of that transit-oriented development. There will be multifamily housing, condos, apartments or both, restaurants, service, retail. Uh, and the like. So uh, we'll, we'll look at an example next of where this is being done outside of Seattle. Next slide. This is a uh, transit-oriented development in Seattle, and what you'll see here is a, two large park and ride services. Uh, seven bus routes serve this facility. You have a mall there, or mixed-use mall area, a hotel. But what's really important is the planning that went into this. So this transit-oriented development that you're seeing here is about 23 minutes by bus to downtown Seattle. You can see what it includes, it's retail, it's condos, it has a cinema, it's apartments. But the really important thing, in 2021, the area that you see in the two red rectangles, this park and ride, that will become a light rail station. As light rail will be extended, we're replacing one of the bus rapid transit lines to the area, and that will be 10 to 15 story transit-oriented development along the right light rail. So you can take a phased approach with these transit-oriented developments as well. Next slide. Uh, I'm Doug Allen. I'm the CEO for the Virginia Railway Express. Uh, what Computer Rail is is a, um, a railroad system designed for passengers who are mostly commuting. In our area, we have two lines, and we basically take people from the outer reaches of the region um, into the core of the region, into um, Arlington area and, and the District of Columbia. Our daily ridership is about 19,000 uh, riders a day. It comes out to about four and a half million riders a year. 90% of our ridership happens during the rush hours. The average trip length for our riders is about 30 miles, so these, the, 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 these commuters are, are coming from long distances. Hi, my name is Sean Simmons-Smith. Uh, I work in D.C. I work at Care First Blue Cross Blue Shield. I live in Woodbridge, Virginia, and I commute from Woodbridge to Union Station. Um, on the train, it's about 45 minutes, 45 to 50 minutes. If I drove six days, no, it's probably more about, I'll say, an hour and a half if I had to drive. Well, in our region, we're, we're one of the most congested regions in the country, um, and the um, prospects of adding more highway capacity are very, very limited at this point. Essentially, the, the, the commuter rail system can operate on the general freight railroad network. It's because we're not stuck in traffic, um, and we work with the railroads that pretty much have free flow, 
Um, about 90% uh, of all of our trips um, arrive on time within five minutes of, of when they're supposed to arrive. Um, the stress associated with, with going to, to driving to work in this region is pretty high. Um, when we have uh, snowstorms or, or bad rainstorms, it gets even worse. So I think mostly what our riders use it for is reliability. It's very comfortable. I get to relax. I get to read, um, work on puzzles. I've met a lot of really nice people on the train, and it's comfortable. Um, it's worth it. It's definitely worth it. Well, it certainly uh, opens up a lot of opportunities for jobs. It is a good tool for people that don't have a car to, to either walk to the station or take a bus to the station to get to a job in downtown. And I think it really adds a lot to the Northern Virginia area and to the whole region. Um, we just, you know, this region just is, is, is in such need for more transportation, reliable transportation, and we fit the bill. And number one, it gets a lot of cars off the highway. Number two, it gives you that chance to unwind in the morning before you get to the job. If you want to do work, if you want to just, you know, be comfortable and relax, you can do that. It takes the stress out of your life. So the video you just saw of the Virginia Railway Express in Northern Virginia, that's the type of service that's envisioned for commuter rail. It would operate on within the existing uh, North Carolina Railroad right of way with expanded capacity to accommodate efficient operation. Uh, we would add tracks, we'd add capacity, but it would operate on the same tracks as Amtrak and the existing freight services. It's a very high level of service designed around commuting periods, and I think it really would have a, a huge beneficial impact to Garner and the way Garner develops to have that service would link you directly to RTP, connection service to the airport, to Durham, to downtown Raleigh, obviously really excited about commuter rail there. So with that, I'm gonna hand this back off to Jim and he's gonna talk to you about a commuter rail project that he was involved in in, in Orlando area and walk through some of the TOD examples uh, that have sprung up around those station nodes. Great, thanks Jeff. Um, so before I, I came here, I was the county manager in Seminole County, Florida. So if we can go to the next slide. Seminole County sits just north of Orlando, a very congested, uh, car-oriented place. How many people have been to Disney World? All right, most of you. So you got to experience some of that, the crowds inside Disney World and outside. So many years ago, the state started looking at um, how to use uh, rail transit in that area. Unfortunately, they weren't quite smart enough to do something in the 90s, and they lost their federal money, which actually went to Charlotte and the Charlotte Light Rail Project. So that was originally awarded to Orlando. So they studied more and more, and you know, there's always some sort of controversy around using rail, right? So um, uh, finally, they, um, they developed um, a, a solid plan to use the freight corridors going in the Amtrak corridor going through, um, through the Orlando area and try to solve some of the traffic problems, especially as it relates to Interstate 4. So the map you see up here is 61.5 uh, miles with 17 stations. Uh, the part in the middle is in operations, has been, I guess they're about uh, at their second year mark um, for, for operations. Um, and they've got some expansions to the south and to the airport uh, underway already. Um, it is a substantial financial investment and that investment is for the future but the dividends will be paid handsomely once, once people start considering uh, the quality of life and also the opportunity for development at many of these stops. Next slide. So um, these are some of the things that SunRail has been working on, uh, growing their ridership, uh, especially peak hour ridership, but they're also seeing a demand to add trains at night that could go to the downtown uh, entertainment district in, in Orlando and so forth and so uh, many venues are starting to uh, jump on board with that. That was intended by the way. Um, and uh, growing the revenues and increasing the last mile connectivity. So this is one of the things as a county manager in Seminole County, my team and I along with our business community and many others, we did a lot of planning for 
um, what to do with the passengers that get off the train, but they're going to a place of employment, some of our corporate centers and so forth, that maybe are a mile or two miles away. Um, not within a walking distance for most people. So how do you connect those? So with planning for rail service, and you know when the trains are coming, so you can also plan really good transit infrastructure so somebody could leave a train and basically with the same ticket get on some sort of connecting uh, mode of transit that will take you to your final destination. Um, and in fact, in Altamont Springs, one of the cities in, um, in Seminole County, uh, they directly give an incentive uh, to Uber to pick up people on demand at the Altamont Springs Station. So they'll underwrite that, I think 20 or 30 percent, in order to get people to that, uh, to their location. And so what that does for the environment and other things is pretty substantial. But let's talk a little bit about development. So next slide. Mm -hmm. And that was just something out of Sunrail, one of their billboards. Next slide. Uh, let me talk about a couple of development uh, examples. Uh, this is Weston Park. This is located in Longwood, uh, the city of Longwood in Seminole County. Uh, this is a, an apartment building with 208 units. Uh, you can see the train station right there uh, at, at the base of that. Um, and um, so we had a developer that came in and the county actually had the development rights because we had purchased all the parking lots. Seminole County put about $40 million in them, purchased the parking lots and also retained development rights. So what that apartment building is sitting on uh, land that uh, was owned by the county um, and we did a very creative deal to make sure that they were to replace parking um, in a parking structure, but they could also locate this apartment complex uh, directly at a, uh, at a Sunrail station. Um, this apartment complex would not have been there without the trains. Next slide. Um, this is another example. This is also in Seminole County. This is uh, uh, Lake Mary. Um, and again, a, uh, an apartment uh, developer. And remember, we're talking about these stops in Seminole County are more suburban in nature. They're not downtown Orlando, even though I'll show a couple of examples of that. But So they're more suburban in nature. So what the market was is for um, multifamily housing is probably the first piece of that. And so both in Longwood and Lake Mary, these projects, uh, as soon as uh, Sunrail was announced that it was funded by the state and going forward, uh, developers started picking up the property, designing and building, and uh, these are in place at this time. Next slide. Uh, this one, which is a Crescent property, is actually in downtown Orlando, uh, right at the um, Sunrail station, which is in the background on this one. Um, again, another example of how development is following the trains. So the next slide, please. So here's a list of uh, how well they're doing. And you can see a um, number of projects completed since 2010 and the level of investment and the permanent jobs. And then you can see the projects in the pipeline. So it's a continued investment that keeps evolving over time. And so when you think about Garner, and you think about the trains that will be here, there's an opportunity in that that you all have to think about very, very carefully. Um, because this will have some direct, probably positive effects on, on how to transport people and on quality of life. And the next slide. And this is just an example of a master plan. All right. Um, and the type of master planning that's beneficial because when people think about the corridors around a rail station, your normal walking corridor is usually a quarter to a half a mile. That's normally what people will walk in order to uh, be able to walk to a station, get on a train or a bus, 
and, and move. So again, how we plan for these in the future, uh, if, if the sales tax passes, is going to be very, very important. And the time to begin thinking about that is now, because there will be some very positive effects to that. Next slide. Um, we're going to move into a couple of examples. So uh, before I was in Seminole County, I was the city manager of Alexandria, Virginia. Alexandria, some people know it as, because they call it Old Town, and it's a piece of Alexandria. Um, but I was in there at a very exciting time when we were planning to, uh, major redevelopment. So I'm going to walk through a couple of those with you. But first, let's uh, go to the next slide and watch a little video. My name is Andre Stafford. I am a uh, bus operations specialist with the Washington Metropolitan Area Transit Authority. Bus rapid transit for us is basically enhancing a customer experience. What you're doing is you're guaranteeing the passenger a uh, safe, reliable, comfortable trip. As you see here, we have a dedicated right-of-way. You have 10-inch curbs where you mimic uh, high-level level boarding. You have transit-specific uh, signaling. The signaling system realizes there's a bus at the intersection, and it says, okay, there's a bus here. I have to give that bus priority. Let's speed up the rest of the traffic cycles and let the bus go through before the surrounding traffic. All of this is is to actually enhance the overall customer experience and to speed up your commute. My name is Lee Farmer. I'm a principal transportation planner with the city of Alexandria. Facilities like this are partially designed to attract people who have choices. You want the bus to be frequent enough that people don't feel that they need to wait for the bus. The bus is there when they need it to be. Providing this kind of transit that's frequent, that runs late into the night, that runs on weekends, you're actually providing an ability for lower income people who really depend on the system to get to work in a reasonable amount of time and not have to dedicate so much of their precious hours to travel. Hi, I'm Peggy from Select. I commute from Crystal City going to the courthouse in Arlington. It's the best because it's reliable. You can go, you can set up your meeting, you're going to be there on time. Um, so to me, it's perfect. That's all I want. And I also know if I missed one, I only have 10 minutes to wait for it. So it's, as I said, it's fast. My name is Michael London. I work at Mr. Tire Auto Centers in uh, Laurel, Maryland. Um, I also work at Target and here in Alexandria. Almost daily, every day I come to work, I use it. I either take it from Crystal City Station to get to um, Potomac Yard, or I take it from here and then ride it up there. It's catching this versus catching like the regular bus, which is the 9A, it's way faster, so you're less likely to be late for work. It's, it's a blessing, honestly. It saves, <laughs> yeah, it saves a lot of time. And one of our big focuses has been on redeveloping in such a way that we preserve existing single-family neighborhoods but then we redevelop into these areas where you're, the ability to kind of create these mixed-use, walkable, bikeable, transit-oriented environments within those corridors. And we know that basically no matter what we do, traffic is going to be continue growing on, on this corridor because of the things that it connects to outside the city of Alexandria. So our idea in terms of the redevelopment had been to create this facility where the people who live and work and play here have an option of traveling without getting on Route 1 in their cars and getting caught in congestion. And the developers recognized that to the extent that they actually donated um, land to help us expand the roadway to put this facility in. So it really provides that regional connectivity, provides travel within the corridor, but then it also provides connections to the rest of the region. Was that helpful? Yeah, it kind of paints a different picture because if you've not seen bus rapid transit, it's kind of hard to visualize it at times. Uh, we were up there with a number of people from uh, Wake County and in the, in the region uh, exploring some of this. I guess it was last month, and um, um, it, it was, it's really um, interesting to watch this. So, and it's interesting for me to be able to talk about a place I used to be and was involved in a lot of the planning because we took this planning very, very seriously because we were growing so rapidly. And this is the lesson to be learned is here we're growing by an average of 64 people per day. So if we don't give some alternatives, it's going to affect our quality of life. So let's walk through a couple of these slides. You can see how this is uh, the bus transit way um, coming from Arlington into Alexandria. 
The difference is the buses that are in the middle of the page are moving and the cars to the side are not. So you heard Lee Farmer, the planner, in the, in the, in the video talk about you know, bus priorities and, and so forth, and that is definitely the case. Next slide. Um, and, and this slide's very interesting because um, the development that you would see on the, the one side, and you can see one that's under construction. So these are all multifamily condos and, uh, and apartments. Um, there is also office buildings and uh, some retail restaurants and so forth that are going in a project called Potomac Yard. The condos up there and the, um, the, the townhomes, especially townhomes, I think start at 800,000. And the people who are moving into this area rely on transit, which is why it is going to be very, very successful. What you see on the other side of the street are the power lines that someday will go underground and a part of Alexandria that has yet uh, been master planned, but they're under that, proper, under that process right now. And it will be planned differently because of the connectivity to transit. Now this whole area in Potomac Yard is outside of that walking zone for, to the regular metro station. So the BRT in Alexandria and Arlington is, was really to connect through some what will become some of the most heavily uh, developed and dense properties in the DC region to connect those two metro rail stations. Next slide. So this is just an example of, of uh, one of the stations uh, in Alexandria. They're pretty simple, but they um, also provide the amenities that, that one needs. And uh, the buses are different. Next slide. This is actually in Arlington County, so you can see how office developers accommodate. And if you can get a stop in your building, that's uh, very advantageous. Next slide. Um, so this is, um, this is, again, another station uh, that was located. Right behind the station is a project um, that, that we built while I was there. And what that is is actually a four-bay fire station underneath uh, 60 units of affordable housing. And uh, the developer, which was Pulte Homes at the time, uh, was very um, gracious to uh, get, actually give us the property. Um, and, uh, and help us fund that uh, through developer contributions. So it sits, and it was one of the catalysts, then we hit the recession, and nothing was built, and today Potomac Yard is almost built out. Next slide. And this is another one of the stations in, in Arlington, uh, but you can see how it, this is in Crystal City, and Crystal City, if you've been there, is and all of this is directly across from DC, directly across the Potomac. Everything's inside the Beltway. So, you know, again, it's very densely populated, and Crystal City will be going under redevelopment. But the increased connections are what are very, very important. Next slide. And so there's a lot more on this. Um, if um, you need information, uh, this is where it is. We wanted to make sure we had a little bit of time for some questions from you all, but uh, hopefully we've um, at least sparked an interest in, in your mind to think about what the future could look like with, um, with increased transit. And before we do questions, I failed to mention there is a scale model of a uh, commuter rail train outside in the lobby. So as you leave or take a break, you may want to give that a, a look as well. Yeah, so. take a look at that. And there are also some transit brochures out there. And I think we brought enough so everybody in this room can take one home. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is John Hodges. I'm the Assistant Town Manager for Development Services for the Town of Garner. And it's my pleasure to be your host for the uh, next section of our program this afternoon that we're calling Garner Ford. And we'll tell you a little bit more about that name in a few minutes. Um, and, but first, we wanted to, to introduce um, a couple of folks who are going to follow up our conversation that we started about transit. Earlier, you heard about the transit plan, and you saw some ideas about how transit-oriented development may happen around communities like Garner. And now we wanted to continue that discussion for a few minutes um, about 
how this plan is going to come about, how citizens can be involved in supporting it, um, as well as some of the more localized impacts. So to do that, we have two guests with us today. First is Wake County Commissioner Sig Hutchinson, um, who was elected to the County Commission in uh, about 2014, I believe, and he currently serves as the Vice Chair, and Sig has been a longtime advocate for transit-related uh, issues. So we're glad to have him here today. Please welcome Sig. Thank you. Thank you. And we also have Garner's own Douglas Ball, known most of us as a local developer, but he is also here today representing the Home Builders Association of Raleigh Wake County, where he has just taken over the chairmanship of that board. So with that, I'm going to turn welcome Douglas. And and I'm going to turn the program over to um, Sig, and then Douglas will follow some comments that he has. Thank you, John. Good afternoon. Everybody happy? That's great. Well, I, I, I'm thrilled to be here um, and to be talking about a, a follow-up around this transit referendum and the transit plan. Uh, in about five to seven minutes, I want to briefly talk uh, about what this plan means for Garner, uh, what this plan means for you personally, and then why we are asking for you to support the referendum when you go to the polls on November 8th. So um, quickly, how many of you have lived in Garner for say one to five years? Can I see those hands? Okay, oh wow, we have a lot of new people here, okay. Six to 10, see those hands, okay. All right, great, more than 10, see those hands. All right, good, all right, so it's a pretty even split, a lot of growth going on. So the folks who've been here for a while, do you notice that things are changing a bit? Now some of that's very positive, and we want that to continue. Uh, some of that is causing a little irritation uh, in terms of our quality of life. In terms of the positiveness, what are some of the things that you would say are positive about the continued growth that we're having? Anyone, just yell it out. Good for business, right. Would you agree over here? Yeah. Anything else? More chamber members. We love that. <laughs> More places to shop. More places to eat, right. What was that last one? More talent, yeah, exactly. More money. More money coming to the community. Sorry? Value of the property's going up. We love that. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and I'll tell you, you have got a great mayor, you've got a great town council, you've got great leadership who are guiding this growth forward. Now in terms of the aggravations associated with that growth, what would some of those things be? Go ahead. Traffic? Congestion? Is that part of the aggravation in your daily uh, quality of life? Yes or no? Yep. And so, Congestion is a big issue that we want to deal with when we start thinking about this transit plan. But it's more than just congestion. We also think we have to think about economic development and the fact that those young millennials, they can move anywhere in the country. And where they want to go is to an urbanizing center where there are more transportation options. Actually, the Triangle area is the largest area of its size in the country without a fixed rail passenger passenger rail system um, for our citizens. So if we're going to continue to be an e economically viable, we need to create more transportation options. Also for seniors. Any seniors out here like me? Yep. When we talk to seniors, the, the, the most um, often concern that comes up for them is transportation. How am I going to continue to be mobile as I get older? And transit is a way that we can provide that level of mobility. Uh, also, workforce and low-income people who need uh, transportation. Many times, our low-income citizens can spend up to 30 or 40 percent of their, their total income on transportation. Whereas, if we took away their ability to have to have a car, we can actually put more money in their pockets. Also, by by creating these vibrant centers, the things that Jim and Jeff were talking about with transit oriented development, we actually create better and stronger communities. You know, there's nothing wrong with the suburbs for the people who want that privacy, but when you can get to know your neighbors and you can commune with your neighbors and do more things with your neighbors, it builds that higher level of community. 
and also for our more vulnerable and, and disabled citizens. Right now we have a paratransit service, but it's not functioning well. And actually we got a cut in, uh, from the, from the um, General Assembly this year. So we do not have a paratransit system which is serving our, vul our vulnerable citizens. This transit plan would allow us to beef up those services for our more vulnerable citizens. So what's in the plan? Okay, um, I've been at this work 10 or 15 years talking and thinking about transit, but as Jim and Jeff mentioned, this last 12 months has been a lot of intentionality around developing this plan. Over 80 leaders, many from Garner, got together to develop uh, a plan that is over a 10 year horizon, a $2.3 billion dollar plan. And as was mentioned earlier, of that 2.3 billion, we as citizens through the half cent tax and a $10 vehicle registration fee will only pay for about 48% of the cost. 52% of the cost is going to be covered through the federal government, um, user fees or fares, and long-term debt. Only 1% of the money will be actually coming from the state government. So we're actually getting a dollar for every dollar we invest in the plan to build out this $2.3 billion system. What's it gonna include? First, bus. And I, and I love the question that someone asked about how will this be rolled out because the first thing that will be rolled out is bus. We will quadruple bus capacity. So we'll be going from 17 miles to 83 miles of bus capacity with 15 minute frequencies. So bus is gonna be a huge part of our plan and we'll be rolling that bus plan out once we pass the referendum in about 18, to 18 months to two years. Second was bus rapid transit or BRT. There were some examples of that. Absolutely fantastic technology. Some, it's kind of a blend between rail and bus but it's bigger buses, better bus stations level floors, you can buy your ticket in advance, so it kind of gives you that rail look and feel. 20 miles of BRT radiating north, east, south, and west from downtown Raleigh, which is gonna be going down Wilmington Street. Now this is, this is huge for Garner, because this BRT, which is gonna have a dedicated corridor and larger buses, will be going straight down Wilmington Street to the uh, 7401 split, and that Wilmington Street has got lots of opportunities for that TOD or transit oriented development, so lots of opportunities for development there. And then rail, 37 miles of commuter rail from east of Garner uh, at, at, at Greenfield Parkway all the way into Durham. So, uh, and that's gonna get started in about seven, five to seven years. Now there's 12 municipalities in, um, in Wake County, we all know that, and my, my colleague, Matt Calabria, Wave with Matt. Uh, he's my fellow commissioner. He's co-chairing this transit effort. We went to see every mayor to ask every mayor and town manager, what do you need in this plan for you to support it? Through that, we developed a system that we feel is equal to every municipality. But obviously, some municipalities are going to be more equal than others. Garner is one of those communities that truly is going to be more equal than others. Don't you love it? Can I get a hand? Okay. You know, you know, kissing on Raleigh's back door, okay, this creates this opportunity to connect to that BRT down Wilmington Street. You're going to have two rail stations, okay, one in downtown Garner as well as one in, in the Greenfield Parkway area. So you are going to be able to have the opportunity to, to take advantage of all three modes of transportation, the BRT, the bus, and the rail, as well as within this plan, which was articulated earlier, you've got the potential to actually add connectors or your own bus system that runs throughout your community, uh, of which the mayor and your town council and manager will actually decide where that goes. And if you wanna partner with other municipalities nearby, you can do that as well. And the system will pay for half of the cost, but you all get to decide where ultimately that, that you want that to go. Okay, so what does it mean for you personally? Okay, so when we start thinking about transit, one of the best things I like to think about is it can save you money. You know, when you start thinking about how we live our lives, we tend to live our lives as a two-car family. But one of the things that we don't think about is that since our cars are built into our budget, we don't tend to think about the cost associated with running, owning an automobile. 
What the experts will tell us is the cost of an automobile, if you look at depreciation, maintenance, gas, it runs about $9,000 a year per automobile. And if a, a two-car family can give up just one car and allow one of your family members to take transit, we can put five, six, seven hundred dollars a month in your pa in your pocket. How many of you would like a raise of five, six, seven hundred dollars a month? Yeah, yeah. I'm I'm digging on that. Okay. Also, uh, stress. And you saw on the BRT uh, a video how stress-free these people are. Uh, Matt and I had a chance to see commuter rail in San Diego, and we talked to the people who are actually taking the rail. And I'll tell you, friends, they absolutely love it. Now, millennials, they don't want to drive anymore. Um, they're not interested in a 45-minute commute because they want to, to play on their smartphones. You know? and, and that's what the, the transit allows them to do, is it gives them a type of lifestyle where they can use transit, and then they can use that time in a stress-free or higher level of productivity. They can actually get some work done uh, on their way to work. They get off the, the train or the bus, and then they walk to work, so it actually builds exercise into your day. So transit is a diet plan. So you can, you can actually get off the train, walk to work, stop at the Starbucks or a coffee place, so when you get to work, you're exercised, you're caffeined, you're awake, and you're ready to go. All of that is available for tran by transit and what it means to you. So it creates healthy communities, vibrant communities, um, and then the, the, the final thing in terms of a benefit is how many of you have taken advantage of our absolutely amazing greenway system here in the, in the triangle? I, if, well, y'all just need to get with it and get out on these amazing, beautiful greenways. We have over 300 miles of greenways here in, in, uh, in, in Raleigh, uh, 300 miles in the triangle, 120 miles of greenways right here in Raleigh. And I have been working with Rodney and the mayor and your town council to build not only more greenways in Garner, but to connect those greenways into Raleigh so you ultimately connect into the grid. Well, friends, this transportation system is not just about bus and BRT and rail. It's about creating a multimodal integrated transportation system so that sidewalks then connect to uh, bike lanes, that then connect to greenways, that then connect to transit, that then connect to destinations where you ultimately want to go. And this is just as much of a land use plan as it is a transportation plan. So this is about how you integrate, how ultimately we live, so you don't have to be in your car as much or at all, and it ultimately gives you more transportation options. So that pretty much talks about what it means for Garner, it talks about what it means for you, and a little bit more about what the plan is all about. I'd like to leave you with two things, two main points. If nothing else, this is what I'd like for you to remember uh, as you walk away. Number one, all of the benefits that we're talking about here, all our ability to grow transit in the future depends on one thing. We have to get started. So no matter how you slice and dice the benefits you see with transit, taking more people off the road so your congestion will not grow as much, to building economic development, to taking care of seniors, to taking care of our workforce and our low-income citizens, um, however you see that, ultimately we have to get started. The second thing that's most important that I'd like to leave you with is that there is no plan B. Our ability to do this referendum ultimately is given to us by the legislature. They give, give us the right to add this, this referendum, they can take it away. In the long session, they almost take it away, took it away. If it wasn't for Senator Johnny Mac Alexander, we would have lost the ability to put this half cent sales tax on the ballot. There is no reason to believe that if we do not pass it today, we will have the opportunity to do it again. Many times as citizens we say, well, you know, I'm not sold on it this time, or I don't particularly like the plan, but I'll vote for it next time. There's very good chance there won't be a next time if we don't pass it this time. There is no plan B. We have to get started. Garner's going to, to significantly benefit from this plan, so we hope that you support us, get your, your friends to support it, get your companies to support it, get your organizations to support it, and be sure and vote on November 8th for the transit referendum. Thank you so much. Thank you, Commissioner Hutchinson. 
I was he couldn't help but notice this list today. There's only three people speaking that aren't getting paid to be here. Uh, one's our mayor, who's obviously very passionate about the town of Garner. You just heard Commissioner Hutchinson and his passion for the transportation plan and Wake County in general. I'm the third. I'm not sure why Neil thinks I'm qualified to be here. You just heard this eloquent speech, but I am a real estate developer and I'm passionate about planning. I'm passionate about good growth. I am a developer, but I see the need. In fact, I served the last six years on our Wake County planning board. And in fact, I've seen this transportation plan develop. It's come from something pretty far-fetched to a very realistic, doable plan. Uh, so I support it. I've been uh, witnessed this program that you all have seen many, many times. As a chair of the Wake County Home Builders Association this year, we had the opportunity to host Commissioner Calabria and Hutchinson make a presentation to ask our board for our support. Without debate, well, with lots of debate, actually, we did pass a resolution in support of this transportation plan. We, as a home building industry, see the importance of a good transportation plan and move these people around. The millennials demand this, and that's who we are marketing to, the sale of homes to. And again, my passion is for Garner and Southern Wake County, and we are about to see a lot, a lot of new homes built in this area probably a lot more than most people in this room really understand. And we don't need to wait to decide we have transportation problems after the homes get built. Our homes are gonna be built as a result of a lot of positive policies that have been put into place with our town council. And we're gonna see the benefits of that in the next few years and within the next decade or so. So again, I support the transportation plan and I ask you all to support it in November as well. Thank you. Thank you again to Sig and Douglas for being here today and sharing their perspective on transit planning. Thank you both.